as long as I'm not uh, too wild and throwing my arms around or anything, I should be okay. Usually I hide the wire inside so I'm protected from snares. <clears throat> Never want to get caught in a microphone, get caught in a snare. Very grateful to have time with you guys and grateful for the fellowship and the, the questions and dialogue in the morning session. It was very nice, the time of communication in the pre-session. It's a good blessing and I'm grateful for that um, opportunity we have together. And so at least you get a little bit of understanding who we are, what we are, and what we do. And we do covet your prayers. We're excited about the things that God has done. And we're excited about what God is doing. So thank God for all that he's doing. And I trust that the Lord will continue to strengthen and stir our hearts. The power of the word of God and our duty to proclaim it. Is the title of my message, The Power of the Word of God and the Duty to Proclaim It. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we come to His Word. Lord Jesus, we thank You that Your presence has been here, God, and You've been encouraging us and convicting us. Lord, You have a purpose for us, and we want to fulfill Your purpose. As believers, we have a duty, and Lord, we want to fulfill our duty faithfully. Lord, we want to fulfill your will. Lord, it is our pleasure. As you said in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And so, Lord, in the same way, we humble ourselves before you and we just acknowledge and confess, Lord, that we have yielded our will to you, fully consecrated all that we are for your life, for your service, for your desire. And, Lord, we know that you in us will fulfill the works that you want to do through us. So, Father, teach us what it means to abide in your presence. Teach us what it means to glean from the presence of God and from the Word of God. And the Lord, it would be you in us and you through us unhindered. And Lord, that we would be dauntless in this world of rage against you. That we'd be fearless in this fight. That we'd be strengthened with all might by your Spirit in the inner man. And we pray, God, as we come to your Word, you would speak to us. We desire your anointing to be upon us because you have a purpose for each one of our lives. And Lord, there's a blessing of an anointing, a, a power of God that comes upon us, a, a strength in personal prayer in the Word of God, a, a blessing in communion with God that the Word of God becomes alive, feeding our spirit as we commune with you. Lord God, would you draw us deeper in that communion in prayer and in the Word of God. Lord, that we would all learn to cultivate your presence, to meditate and feed on the Word of God all day and all night, that we would be ready in season and out of season to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. With stability and clarity, we would fulfill your will. Lord, we want to speak in tongues that man by your grace could understand throughout all the world. And we want a life so pure and clear that anyone through any lens could see you in us. We ask, Lord, that we would fulfill your duty. The duty you have put upon us. The calling to proclaim the truths of the word of God. And the blessing of feeding in your presence and receiving from heaven those things that we have heard and seen of our Father, that we would fulfill your will and do it, and that we would show the world who you are, the expressed image of the Godhead bodily Christ in us and through us, living and moving and having our being in the presence of God as our body is the temple of God as we sang, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, true and holy. Lord, this tested and tried and true vessel, pure and holy unto you. Lord, have your way, Father. You're worthy. Bless this time in your word. Anoint us by your spirit. Speak for your glory. Ignite our hearts and anoint us that everywhere we go in life, we would carry the presence of God as the ark carried that presence of God. Great and terrible was the presence of God in this world. And Lord, so is it among your people, the mighty one in our midst. Lord, we lift up a cry, thanking you that you are most glorious in holiness and yet so practical and personable that you would dwell among us as a man, that you would live through us of your nature, so beautifully divine and yet humane. Lord, we thank you, Father, of this reality that we have. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the fellowship we share. Bless us now as we come to your word. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and Master. Amen. Amen. John chapter 8, if you'd turn with me, we'll go through some scriptures. There's a blessing in the presence of God, 
and the power of his word that we don't want to miss any time that we come together. We have a purpose for coming together. We're very intentional about coming here. And if we come with a desire to hear from God, we'll hear from him. If we listen for the word of God and we're sensitive to his spirit, even through a bad preacher and even through a dirty vessel, God could still speak something to our hearts. So we don't want to get distracted with how we like older people, how we like younger people, how we like fiery preaching, how we like teaching, dry teaching, or anything else that we like or don't like. God, help us not to be so picky. Help us to be very desirous for God to speak to us, even if it's to teach us things that we don't want in our life. Like, I don't want to live like that person. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to see these things. I don't want to say these things. There's a lot of things that we can glean from God when we come to Him. Turn with me to John chapter 8. We'll start from verse 25. We'll read down to 30. John 8, 25 to 30. <clears throat> then said they unto him, Who art thou? So the people asked of Jesus, Who are you? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. So what did Jesus say? The same as I have been continually telling you from the beginning. How slow are we to learn sometimes, how slow they were to hear. Jesus has said, you're dead in your sins. They weren't hearing. Verse 26. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. That's speaking of God the Father. Verse 27. They understood not that he spake unto them of the Father. So still they didn't understand. Verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up, when ye, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Let's read down through 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. It is very fascinating. He's speaking to a group of people that knew about him. They knew him, and then we might even parallel that with some through Matthew and some through Mark and, and uh, Luke that had talked about this idea of saying, Lord, Lord, we have heard you in our streets and in our synagogues. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. We never had an intimate knowledge. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. And they came and they said, oh, Lord, who are you? Oh, oh man, who are you? They asked in verse 25. Their hearts were hardened. As we've seen of Pharaoh, it's something of a stubbornness of the will of man, not willing to receive and embrace truth. Because God brings truth in a way that, that is able to be understood by any age. God ministers truth to the heart. But if we hate the truth and resist it, then we can start to darken our hearts and minds. Our hearts can be hardened. Our eyes can be closed. And our ears can be dulled and not hear. Um, there's... Thousands of prophecies terrifyingly through the word of God to that nature. Having hearts that cannot perceive and ears that cannot hear, nor can they see with their eyes. I mean, that's terrifying if you study through that prophecy, um, starting maybe a, a lot of points throughout um, the, the writings of Moses and so on, but then culminated in Isaiah when he said, this is the ministry I've given you, go and preach, and their hearts will be hardened and, and harden their hearts. And dull their eyes and their ears, lest at any time they hear with their hearts and hear with their ears and receive with their hearts and understand and be converted and be saved. I mean, that's an amazing parallel of many different scriptures through the Word of God. 
Who are you? Jesus said, I'm the same that I said to you from the beginning. Brothers and sisters, the word of God has power. Are we receiving the word of God? I mean, period. They, they had a lot of good teachings. We've had a lot of good teachings. You guys have amazing time, amazing family time, amazing friendships. You guys are blessed in friendship and fellowship and evangelism and teaching after teaching. We know so much with our heads. And yet, they still came and asked the same old question that he said, I've been sharing with you from the beginning. And I have many things to say and to judge of you. But I do those things that I've seen and heard of my father. Truth. Truth. There's power in the truth when we embrace it. Chains are loosed and hearts are set free. Men and women are saved and born again by the word of God. Who are you? I'm the same that I've told you from the beginning. And I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. So God is true. And the time will come when he will permit me to, to speak and to judge. And many different things that Jesus did and will do. <clears throat> the middle of verse 26 says, And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Brothers and sisters, we have a duty to speak those things that we have heard from him. And God's truth is timeless and solid. Um, how is your reception of the truth? Are you open and receiving? Are you feeding? Then he said, I've, I've told you these things. I speak to the world those things that I've heard of him. But verse 27 says, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. They still didn't have their hearts open. But those who are open to the truth, could we say even again, those that practice the truth, those that embrace the truth, those that love the truth, those that love the light, those that walk in the light, those that seek the light, there can be a blessing of a fellowship. These that were not willing to embrace the truth, they did not receive and they didn't hear it. And that's a scriptural truth. If any man do his will, he shall know the doctrines, whether I speak of myself or whether I speak of another, Jesus had said. But think upon that. I'm grateful when I find even sinners and heathen that are seeking truth. And when they hear the truth of the word of God, they say, yes, that's what I've been seeking. And they embrace it wholeheartedly. And as truth comes, they say, yes. And as a believer, we love the truth no matter how sharp and piercing and pointed it is. Even if today I'd be a crazy prophet and I'd point out the sins in your life that God's dealing with or whatever issues in your life that God wants to deal with and you see it and you say, yes, you're not going to run from the truth. And there's a neat blessing among people in this world. There are some people at your work and in your life that, that are open to truth. And when we start engaging, God starts opening doors. And you'll know them because they'll respond to the truth. Now, we don't know who those people are unless we meet, unless we share. But when we find people that love the truth, they'll grow in it. I'm not right in everything. But if you confront me in truth and say, Brother, this area that you are, are, are sharing or something here or something there in your life or character or doctrine, you come to me and say, Well, I think that this is um, you know, not accurate or this is something maybe you didn't see. And if you share, then I love the truth and I want to grow. Right? There's something of growth in the body of Christ. There's something of receiving. That's why we seek God in His Word daily and in prayer, meditation, memorization. We feed from God. And the power of His Word feeds us daily. Amen. Follow that simply. Because it's something that Jesus said, I've heard of Him. And I do those things that please Him. Do you hear that? To hear it, to receive it, and to embrace it, and to walk in it brings power through it. When we hear the truth, we embrace the truth, we have stability through the truth, and we grow forward in the truth. And when we use the truth, it's powerful. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it bears power through us because it's bore power to us. Do you understand? The truth, it's so simple, and yet these people heard it again and again, and they were not influenced for the good by it. When we hear the truth and don't embrace it, we can grow harder. We can dull our conscience, harden our hearts, dull our ears, and our eyes can be blinded. It's amazing. But let's follow on. They didn't understand that he spake to them of the Father. Verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man. Then shall ye know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me. I speak these things. That's a very deep and packed scripture. 
of communication. He's saying, you people that are asking me the question, who am I? I am from the Father. I do the things that please the Father. As I hear him speak, I am speaking. And when you crucify me, when you lift me up, they understood what that meant to a degree. They knew of the Roman crucifixion. They knew very well. And when he said that, he said, when you lift me up, then, then you'll see. But then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing by myself. You will know that I am God in the flesh and that I do nothing of myself. Even though I speak with great boldness and authority and clarity and power and you hate me for it and you're questioning me because of it, when I am lifted up, when I'm crucified, when you kill me, then you will see that yes, truly, I've done those things that please the Father and you'll see by my life and by my death that I have walked even as my Father has taught me. And as I've spoken and lived, think about it. God allowed the Jews and the people to persecute, attack, and crucify Christ. And through it all, God made an example. There was power in Christ. He loved God. He walked with God. He chose to obey. And he, he walked in those things that pleased the Father. He was God in the flesh without sin. It wasn't just a, a casual just drift and everything was really easy for him because he never had trial. He suffered tremendously. We know that. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He, he just pleased the Father and he heard from the Father and he spoke even though people would hate him. He wasn't afraid of man. Brothers and sisters, let us embrace the word of God. We have a duty. Let's not fear men. Let's pray for wisdom, how to share. And pray for their hearts that they might be open, their eyes that they might see. There's a power in the presence of God, brothers and sisters. A power that we grow in as we commune with him and feed on his word. And the fear of man is pushed away by the fear of God. After you kill me, then you'll see that I don't do those things of myself. I do the things that please the Father. Verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, God is with you. He's with you. That's powerful in the context of being the Son of God, hearing from God, walking out His will. He said, my Father, is not, I'm not only speaking on behalf of my Father, but He's here with me. You know, I am with Him. We are one in thought and work and deed, and He is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Even though you might surround me like an enemy, my Father has not left me alone. And I do always those things that please the Father. It just thrills me. He's not left me alone. For I do always those things that please Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and my Father will love you. And my Father will love you. Right? There's something of a, of a, a love that's different. And I, I thought to share this with some of our brothers preaching. But it's something very simple. But God has a, a desire, a love for the world. A, a, a benevolent love, a charitable love to do the best, greatest good in this world. God wants to do the greatest measure of good to any sinner. God loved a man and, and sent his son to die that that man might be united with him through Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, that that man can enjoy the fullness of God and that he can be set free from his sins and changed in, into the image of God and satisfied. God loves every sinner that way. A charitable love, a benevolent love, desiring the good of another. That is the love of God for all creation. And yet there's a love of complacency, a love of satisfaction. That when God looks at that man who's been born again, and this man is loving God and walking with him in obedience, God says, yes, I am well pleased. And there's a special communication of that love to us as believers who have come to Christ. And that's the love that as we, we love God and we walk with him in the light, we grow with him. He accepts us. He loves us. Yes, praise God. But he's delighted in us. And the Christ in me delights in the Christ in you. And Jesus in the body makes his body beautiful. Otherwise that we have issues and attitudes that can come up. And if you were a follower of me, you'd find my faults. And if I wasn't saying, follow me as I follow Christ, you know, when I make a mistake, I humble myself before you too. And I say, I'm sorry. And I humble myself before Christ and apologize. Right? There's an honest, humble reality that comes from the presence of God. Jesus was lifted up and crucified. And he said, you will know that I've come from the Father. And I do always those things that please the Father. Okay, you follow the context. Jesus said, you want to know who I am? You just wait and watch me. 
die. You watch me die. And then you will know that I am with the Father and He has not left me alone. And I do always those things that please the Father. Not just when you love me and kiss me and throw palms before me, but even to the point of death, I do always those things that please the Father. And He's with me. Can you imagine seeing Jesus crucified and remembering these words like he, he told us who He was. He told us the pleasure of the Father with Him and how He spoke the things of the Father, how He lived out the will of the Father, and now we see Him crucified, obedient unto death. And He did always those things that pleased the Father, and He never resisted. He never sought to just guard and protect His own. Even the natural man did not want to suffer and die. Jesus prayed, saying, Lord, if there's any other way, if it be Thy will that this cup could pass from me, so be it. But he did those things that pleased the Father. And he was obedient even unto death. Verse 30, And as he spake these words, many believed on him. He was speaking to a group. And sometimes we can also use this opportunity as we love Jesus, as we know him, and as we are praying. You know, we talked about an arrow, right? I often say, like, we have a gospel truth and we have an arrow ready. So if you're ready with the arrow, when the opportunity arises, maybe you're hunting, you can shoot. And at work and at, at the gas station and everywhere, let our arrows and be ready for the gospel truth. That just, you know, hello, how are you? I'm well. Can I share with you what touched my life? Just shooting some gospel truth. And they don't have to know that, they're, that you know, you're coming at them with an arrow. You know, we don't come at them and say, let me tell you something. But it's very neat that we have the opportunity to share something that could revolutionize their life. Truth. With a capital T, we know Him, and we know His Word. And we speak those things that we've learned from Him. Praise the Lord. I'm grateful for that. We should be ready in season and out of season. And in this situation, it seemed there was a target. There's somebody asking, who are you? you know, who are you? Maybe it was the scribes and Pharisees, and they're the ones that are standing there, and He said, you're going to be the ones to crucify me. But he speaks these things to all. His target maybe not even to shoot at the person that's asking him. Maybe he's not even attacking or judging the person asking. Maybe he's looking at this person over here paying attention and saying, you will know when I'm crucified that I do those things that please the Father. No matter what they do to me, I do the things that please the Father. And in this crowd, some people believed on him. Praise the Lord. They were Jews. And they were close to those, whoever they might have been, scribes, Pharisees, mixed multitude, um, you know, some of these rulers that were with him, some of these ungodly people that were around him, they were asking questions with this group. I do always those things that please him, and as he spoke these things, many believed on him. Then Jesus cuts that communication and turns aside and, you know, kind of says to this, this group that believes on him, so he, he kind of turns his aim for a second in verse 30, he said, as he spake these words, many believed on him. In verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You will be my disciples indeed if you continue in my word. Do you understand? You hear my word, take my word, embrace my word. I would be terrified. I would say, Lord, I want to be your disciple, but I didn't even have a pen and paper, and I didn't write down all the words you wrote. I'd be like, God, I just can't write fast enough. And Jesus, say that again. Would you please repeat that? What did you just say? And, and I forgot. And what did he say? And now I'd be, I'd be stirred. Maybe that's where they were, as the scribes and Pharisees are saying, we were never Abra we were, we were Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How can you say that we'll be made free? Maybe they're writing notes. <laughs> Maybe they're going, oh, he said, if you continue in my words and you'll know my word and you'll be my disciple and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And Maybe they were just excited in that way. I'd be afraid, you know, continue in my word. But God preserved his word. And many times throughout the scriptures, Jesus Christ was revealed through the scriptures. We hear of Philip appearing at the chariot and he preaches Christ through the scriptures and Jesus opened the scriptures and the road to Emmaus and sharing through the law and the prophets, sharing through the whole word of God, revealing himself by the scriptures. It's really neat. It's a blessing. And he continues to reveal himself. 
Verse 32, after he said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. Verse 32 says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. There's a fellowship with God, there's a communing with Him, there's a receiving from Him, and there's a sharing of that with others. Those that believed on Him, Jesus said, I'm committing something to you, the truth of who I am. And we know now that it's the gospel that He would die for our sins. And that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we throw ourselves upon Him, if we trust Him and surrender, we can be saved. And we're, we're saved from sin. We're saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the power of sin. And we come into His truth. Now men and women are going to hell. Now they need truth. The only means whereby God saves a soul. The gospel comes to them through the power of the Spirit of God. The, the work of God goes on. But there needs to be a message. God moves upon the message. He could have sent angels. He could have written it across the sky. He could trumpet it. When he comes, there's going to be a loud trumpet and the heavens will be rolled back as a scroll. I think if he did that once, many people would believe on him really quick. I, I just was fancying myself that if I were a little mischievous, if I were even, even one of those people like when Jesus rose from the dead, many that were dead, they also rose and they also went through the city. That must have been exciting. I thought sarcastically, I guess if I was Jesus, I would have liked to have popped in Herod's bedroom or, or Pilate's bedroom and said, Boo! <laughs> you crucified me, <laughs> but uh, hi, you know. I appeared, you know, a couple days ago to your wife, but you didn't listen to her. You know, I mean, I think you'd, you'd really make some believers really quick. Jesus just didn't want to make believers. He wanted to make disciples, and he appeared only to his disciples. I mean, I probably would have walked through town and said, I told you I was coming back. They'd be terrified. But when they heard the power of Jesus, they said, maybe it's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Maybe this Jesus is John Baptist risen from the dead because we didn't want to hear the message and we cut off his head. And maybe he's risen from the dead. He's got power with God. And they were afraid of him. But there was truth that set the people of God free. I was lost. I was a sinner. What does that mean? The whole consecration of my will, my energy was focused on pleasing myself and not on pleasing God. Brothers and sisters, when you share the word of God, when you share testimonies, when you share the scripture, share those practical points of evangelism, this truth, the nature of sin is self-love. And that no matter how wild and wicked my life might have been compared to the good Christian sinners, dead, dead Christian sinners, still... We are sinners who love our sin. We do what we know we should not do. And we resist what we know we should do. So when I share with people, I share, you know, you're a sinner that deserves hell. Because you love your sins. You know what to do and you don't do it. You know what's right. And yet you resist it. And God gave us that conscience to bear witness to truth. And so I share with sinners the reality that that God loves them so much that He didn't kill them yet. God loved me so much when I was a wicked sinner loving myself that He'd spare me. God gave everything in creation for the utmost of His glory and our enjoyment with Him. And we took all of God's creation and we consume it for our own desires and our own lusts and passions. Mind and energy and money and body and marriage and children and family and life and everything good. And we turn it and only use it for our own happiness without loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What a selfish, wicked generation we are. I mean, that's the whole world. What Jesus does is sets us free, and now our love is no longer self-centered. Now we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We've surrendered fully to Him. And He searches us out and shows us any area where that love might be dividing and saying, well, you cannot serve God and mammon. Be careful and watch out for your own heart. We can't serve God and gardening. I mean, you name it. Anything else in our lives. There's many, many things that can rise up where we are more distracted and more concerned and more excited and we are not enjoying the Lord, but we're concerned about marriage and money and ministry and whatever else might be there. It's amazing. Be careful to watch for any of those weeds. You will continue in the truth and you will continue to know the truth and you'll continually grow from freedom to freedom to freedom to freedom. Amen.
that thrills my heart. Yes. And you know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. And not only is it that, but you will also find this freedom that lasts. Think about that, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Let's skip to another chapter as we think upon his truth that ministers to us, his word. Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We'll read verses 13 to 20. <clears throat> and now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Let me stop for a second. Jesus Christ is praying like a high priestly prayer in John 17. It's almost as though we peek into the veil of the old tabernacles, the temple, the holy of holies, Jesus Christ communing with the Father. We don't really have many prayers, and this might not even be much of a prayer. It might just be a casual conversation with the Father. But I know that Jesus wasn't trite and light and half-hearted and just careless and casual with all of his words babbling. Right? He was calculated. He used his energy wisely. He used his time wisely. He spoke wisely. And he didn't waste words. And this is his communion with the Father. And he says, I now come, and now come I to thee. Jesus is coming before the Father. He's in the presence of the Father. The veil's open to us, brothers and sisters. Pay attention. Verse 13. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I've spoken your truth in the world, that they might know the joy that they can have with you and with me. We know these things reiterated in 1 John. These things write, we, these things write down to you, right, that you sin not. And earlier he said, we've written these things to you that you may have joy, that you might have fellowship with us and with the Father. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, and so on. Five or six other mixes of scriptures there speaking the same thing. That you might have my joy fulfilled in them. That they might have my joy fulfilled in them. Verse 14. I have given them thy word. I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you have received the word of God. And you will be hated by the world. That's very painful. When we think in a context that, Lord, we've shared the word that they might know the joy that we have with you, and yet they will hate us for it. We love our family and sow into our family the words of truth and soberness that they might enjoy the Lord, and yet they become a target of the enemy. And the world hates us. Because we do always those things that please the Father. Brothers and sisters, where are our hearts at? Jesus gave the word. He spoke. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. If we lived in the ways of the world, if we walked and talked in the ways of the world, they would delight in us tremendously. But our lives are a contrast I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from, e from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Jesus said, I've given your word, I've given the truth. Sanctify them through your truth, because you are truth. And the words that I've spoken are truth. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also 
which shall believe on me through their word. Let me stop there. Jesus is saying, Lord, I have heard from you, and I have spoken as from you, those things that I've heard of you. And not only do I pray for my disciples that they would grow more one with you and that they might be ready for the suffering and trial and that they might enjoy you and be fully set free and be disciples. Not only do I pray for them, but I pray for those that will also hear their word. The messengers share the message and those that will come along that will also hear and share the message. So all of us as evangelists, as messengers of truth, need to preach the word in season and out of season. Be ready always to give an answer. That means sick and tired and maybe sleeping in the car and then all of a sudden waking up and stepping out of the car and some crazy person comes. Are we ready with the gospel? Right? I mean, I think of it, you know, we often twist it like be ready in season and out of season to preach a good sermon when the preacher calls you to the pulpit. Brothers and sisters, we miss it. We miss it. God wants to minister truth to us that we might minister truth to others. And in season, out of season means, means when I just broke my finger, am I still full of the grace of God and still able to share here and there as I go? There's a lot of different things that can come up in life, but there's a lot of different opportunities. We fail. We're not ready in season, out of season. No condemnation, but there's something that we need to grow in. It's a communion with the Father where we draw from Him. And we speak as from Him. We do only those things we see our Father do. We speak only those words we hear from our Father. There's a communion that we have. We speak the words of truth. And Jesus is not only praying for His disciples, He's praying for all of those that would believe through their word. So Jesus said, God, I have committed your word to your people. I've done my duty. Now he urges the people, take the word and bring it to the world. Preach the word. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> we know also the story of that Philip, evangelist, running along next to the chariot and he hears this Ethiopian eunuch reading through Isaiah. Right? He was reading out loud in his chariot. Chariots aren't quiet, right? Amen. <laughs> and he's riding along in a loud chariot. And he hears him reading the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. And God said, go join yourself with this chariot. And he heard him reading. Don't be afraid to read the Bible out loud. And don't be afraid to read it to others out loud. Even that they might not want to hear it. I don't know. It's just different times. God does many different things. But we shouldn't be such chickens as we are. We should be really filled with compassion. And um, ready in season, out of season. Sometimes I just, you know, you catch fish with bait and some people really want to talk, but they don't know how to approach you because you seem so different. So if you just have a Bible open on your table at the uh, restaurant, people see and if they want to talk, you've given them a good bait. Say, oh, that's a good book you got. What are you reading? I mean, give people the opportunity. So if you're a Christian in your workplace, you're different. People will also start talking about you. Oh yeah, that guy thinks he's spiritual, you know, and they might say it loud enough so you hear. There's a lot of different things that God brings. Why? So he can say, don't worry, the world will watch and it'll be my gospel proclaimed, right? When, when people put us in situations because they want to test us or they're angry at us, or the devil uses situations, God allows it. And we're spectacles to all men. Living epistles known and read of all men. Isn't that amazing? Ye are our epistles. Paul said, there's something of this gospel proclaimed that not only did Christ, Christ commit the words of truth to his disciples, but even those that had received the truth, they shared that testimony. And there's a blessing and an example that the Lord strengthens and uses. There's some very, very powerful scriptures and truths that continue to stir the heart. But would you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1? Just sharing some closing thoughts. There's a lot of interesting situations we go through. And yet the Lord's perfect in the midst of it. First Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Verses 23 to the end. 23 to 25. First Peter chapter 1. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. This is the word that's preached to you. So he's saying that we have found this reality of life and being born again through this incorruptible seed, through this heavenly seed of the word of God that brings forth like a plant seed also brings forth. The same human seed brings forth of a birth of a baby. God, by his word and by his spirit, births reality in us. Look at the verse before, verse 22. Speaking on the nature as we had about sanctification and the work of God's Spirit, verse 22 says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. The truth. You've obeyed. You've been purified. Your souls have been purified. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. means unwavering and unfalsified love. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Amen. Sanctified through the word of God. Changed by the word of God. Growing. And our soul is purified. Areas that we can't touch and see and hold. God is changing as we embrace that which is unseen and unheld and unsensed. The gospel of Christ. The truth. Purifying and cleansing and washing. And the dealings of this sanctifying work of God in our hearts. The Spirit brings this life and there's this working of God in us that we have this purified love for the brethren that we should walk it out. That we should love one another with a pure heart fervently. And this is the gospel which is preached to you, Peter was saying. This is the gospel that's preached to you. This seed from heaven that brings new life. That dead men are raised, spiritually speaking. The blind men, spiritually speaking, are restored to sight. Brought to sight. Think about the reality of who we are and think about the gospel we've received. Thank God for His faithfulness. And this is not like this grass which is today and is gone tomorrow. The end of verse 23 says, The Word of God, the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Everything in this world will pass away and fade away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Verse 25 but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The word of the Lord endureth forever. The eternal works of God in us will abide for eternity. The work that God is doing right now in us and everything that He does through us will abide for eternity. Your little obedience today stores up eternal treasures in heaven for Christ and His glory. The little actions of your life, your, your extended time of prayer just to seek the Lord and draw closer to Him. You're building up treasures in heaven. There's a communion with God, something more heavenly in your own life and heart and more fruitful in this world. There's something that God's invested in us. The seed of His Word, the working of His Spirit, and God's working in us. And on Judgment Day, when we're brought through the fires of judgment, some things will be dissolved to nothing wood and hay and stubble. But on the flip side, there are silver and gold and precious stones. It's amazing. But when that day of judgment comes, and everything's dissolved and reduced to ashes, it's only your life in love with Jesus Christ and His Word that will really matter anything at all. All that we've done in love for Him, all that we've seen Him do and we've done, how we've dealt with others the way He's dealt with us. How we've spoken the truth to others as He's spoken the truth to us. So let me ask you a couple practical questions. How much do you love Jesus? Part of those answers are, how do you love the Word of God? Do you take time alone daily? Are you soaking in the Word of God? Are you feeding on the Word of God? Are you enjoying Jesus in the Word? Is the Word feeding your soul? Are you meditating on it? Are you chewing on it? Are you taking in the Word of God? A second aspect of that question is, how is your prayer life? How is your time in prayer, sharing and communing? Not just lifting up prayer requests. We could do that until the sun goes down. Jesus never did that either. Neither did the saints. Otherwise, they never would have tried to sleep. They would have just tried to lift up every request. Because if we look at only one life, there's a billion prayer requests. More than a billion, maybe, right? 
in one little life. But as we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, everything else will be added to us. As we commune with Christ in reality and who He is, and as His truth is ministering to us, we are knowing the truth and we're growing in the truth, we're continuing in the truth, and we're being set free by the truth. Eternal works in us. Relationship from the Word of God and from prayer and communion with Christ. That will abide the fire of judgment day. Wood and hay, stubble, silver, gold, precious stones. Young and old, God help us to think about these things. That we don't waste our life on stubble. I appreciate Leonard Ravenhill preaching, and he was preaching on the judgment scene. He said, you know, you give a man $10,000, you know, one invests in wood and another in hay, another in stubble. But he said, what do you have when the fire goes to it? All you have is ashes, maybe up to the ankles. And that's all that's left. It's a very sobering reality. We're all allotted 24 hours in a day. We've all received a mind and a spirit, body, soul, and spirit. God has given everything necessary and everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's given us all spiritual riches and treasures. And He's going to ask us on Judgment Day, what did you do with my son? What did you do with my word? Some thought, brothers and sisters, as there is power in the gospel power in the Word of God to seek and save the lost. Power to be changed. There's not only power in us and to us, but it's power through us. The Gospel of Christ preached the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. So we have a duty, a duty to preach the Word. I think some people understand the word duty a little bit stronger than others, but a soldier who's at his post, he stands his post, he's fulfilling his duty. He's on duty right now. He can't just laugh, joke, and play. He's on duty. If he falls asleep in his guard, he's failed his duty, and catastrophe could happen. Brothers and sisters, let's be on guard. Let's be on duty. Let's fulfill our duty. As mankind, God's given us a purpose, and that purpose is to love and enjoy Him. And the second part of that purpose is to love others and seek their good also. Do you understand? To love Him and to love others also, that by any means, by any measure, we might be able to reach them. One writer wrote, Oh, with what shall I win them? Oh, that I could tell. I'd write to them in tears. I'd weep out every argument. I'd empty my veins for ink. Oh, how thankful would I be if they'd be prevailed with to repent and turn. Brothers and sisters, love, love. We don't want them to perish. God doesn't want them to perish, and He sent His Son, and He gave full resource. And we have an arsenal. We have a Bible full of revelation and truth that's practical and implementable in the life of a non-believer. They can believe on Christ and be saved, and touching every different aspect of our nature. It's amazing. And we have the words of truth and soberness, brothers and sisters. Let's take this duty joyfully, and by the power of God in us, it can be the power of God through us, and can change lives. I think many praying mothers and many praying grandmothers have brought millions into the kingdom or billions throughout the years. Men and women who prayed. May the Lord teach us to grow in this love with Him and may He teach us to walk with Him in this communion in His Word and may we be ready in season and out of season to speak the words of truth and soberness. Keep that arrow ready. That at the, the action of kindness or the, the kind word or the kind deed or the loving thing or whatever it is, Whatever situation where their heart opens a little bit, we're ready. I think it was one of these old writers from the 15 and 1600s that, that I think it might have been William Grinnell who wrote, you know, love bears the breast. You know, removes all obstacles. Our love and our care removes all obstacles. <laughs> the power of the gospel can be thrust in. It's a pretty powerful word picture. Practical life and practical love and just bears the breast, <laughs> thrust in the truth. Be ready. Be ready. You know, if you've ever been hunting or if you've ever shot with a bow and arrow, it's hard to hold it back for a long time. Right? To really be ready and to love the Lord and to enjoy. Yes, it's a discipline, it's a labor, but it's profitable. But God help us to be wise and to be able to minister to others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's be strengthened in His work. Let's be strengthened in prayer that we might grow in Him. He is worthy and He is faithful.
we have a duty, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we are very grateful you have committed to us the words of reconciliation. This gospel of truth has set men and women free. The power of God in us, this word, this seed, that we could be changed and born again. That we could hear and receive and embrace the truth and be changed. The word of God that lives and abides forever. And Lord, you said, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. We thank you, God, that we can be purified and changed and grow in spiritual wisdom and maturity. Whereby we might be able to impact this world for your glory and for eternity. That this little moment in time is pregnant with eternity. Seeds of reality and truth that, that converts parts of temporal situation into eternal fruitfulness. Things that would otherwise be burnt up. Things in our life that could otherwise be wasted. Yet, Lord, you sanctify to us our deepest distress. We thank you, God, for the blessing of fullness and freedom and joy. We thank you for who you are and we ask, God, that you would meet us. And that, that your truth would penetrate us deeply. That we would embrace your word. That we would be a people who love your word and love prayer. We would be in the presence of God, anointed by your spirit. Ready, God, to speak the words of truth and soberness. Anointed by your power. Ready, God, in season and out of season to speak the words of truth. Father, would you guide us? Father, would you speak to us? I ask, Lord God, that you would have mercy on us, God, as we've suffered many things. We pray that you would speak. Pray, God, that you would minister to us now, God, as we seek to embrace your word. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read for you this song that we sang this morning. I'm not sure how many verses were there, but this one has seven verses. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? You who unto Jesus for refuge have fled. In every condition, in sickness and health, in poverty's veil or abounding in wealth, at home and abroad, on the land, on the sea, as thy days may demand, shall thy strength ever be. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen and help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand when through the deep waters I call thee to go. The rivers of woe shall not thee overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. And sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathways shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Hallelujah. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design. Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Even down through all ages my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And when hoary heads shall their temples adorn like lambs, they shall still in my bosom be born. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do ask God again that you would show us the reality of who you are and the power of your spirit and word and all that you've given us. We pray, Lord, that today, God, we'd be encouraged and provoked knowing that our life is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. But they that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So you said, Lord, be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So Father, we thank you, God. You said in due season you shall reap if you faint not. So Father, anoint us by your Spirit as we learn, as we grow, as we suffer. We thank you as we embrace your truth, we continually are set free. We thank you for who you are in us and through us. And we pray, Lord, that your power will just be understood and known more and more. Meet us where we're at, who we are, why we are, what gifts you've given us. Lord, giving us also guidance and wisdom that as husbands we'd know how to strengthen the gifts in our wife. And to guide out in our children's lives and to bless God. And that we would be wise in our dealings and our trainings and discipling. Lord, that our children might grow into grace and glory. That we would be ready in season and out of season, day and night, to impart life and truth. Lord, we need to draw from you that we might have to give to those in need. We need to draw on your presence that we might have to give to those in their time of distress. We thank you, Father, that you guide us and that you lead us and you teach us. We thank you. Your power and your grace is sufficient. Lord, teach us to pray. And let the word of God dwell in us richly. God, as we sing in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts even to the Lord. Because, Lord, you are worthy. And we'd be rooted and grounded in the truth of the word of God, memorizing, meditating, prepared, ready. That whatever different branch of life or labor or work, we'd be anointed by your spirit with our bow and arrow ready. Knowing, God, that the arrows are like these children are like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, even a king thrust through the heart of his enemies. We just thank you for that glorious freedom that we have as the children of God, that we're not bound, but Lord, free. We don't have some expectation of the world to fulfill, but Lord, just to please our Father which is in heaven. They might look at us as though we're crazy, but Lord, you are worthy. We might suffer and be hated because of who we are, and yet, Lord, you are worthy. And Lord, they will know that we have spoken the truth that comes from heaven only, they will know and they will see, Lord, even if it's not in our lifetime, at the judgment seat, truly every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Lord, in that time of bowing the knee, it'll be too late. They'll be damned. And our life and our testimony will flash before their eyes. And they'll see who you were in us and through us. And they'll see the times you reached out to them. They'll see every moment that you reached them with the truth and they resisted. Every time they heard and thought upon the truth and, and hardened their hearts against it. The choices of their will. Oh God, the wicked will have a terrible day to pay on judgment day. But Lord, we as your children rejoice, God, that we'll also look through our lives, I'm sure. And see every prayer that was offered up for us. Every person you sent. Every time we embraced the truth. Our time of need and distress. And you ministered to us. Lord we thank you God that you are a God that's faithful. And we thank you Lord you're a God that loves us. We ask God that you would just continue to open your word to us. And teach us Lord what it means to commune in the presence of God. As Ravenhill said no man is greater than his prayer life. Lord we really want a life of communion with you. That we might be great in the eyes of God not of man. For indeed, Lord, as we enter into that closet in secret, it is our Father which sees in secret that will reward us openly. This sweet communion, God, don't let us pass it by. The power and stability of the Word of God, don't let us waste it. Father, we just bless you and thank you for all that you provided. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your truth. And thank you for the plans you have. Anoint us and bless the rest of this fellowship time and this meal. We love you. We trust you in Jesus' name.